we thank you so much, and let's introduce our speaker hot, shall we? John, thanks for introducing us this morning. If you have a Bible, find your way over to Exodus chapter 13. We're going to continue in our series in the life of Moses. What do you do when God leads you to a dead end? You know, sometimes you go to a social event and there's a is an icebreaker. And one of the questions sometimes you get asked is, is what was the your most favorite present you got at Christmas or at a birthday party when you were growing up? And I know the answer to that question right off the bat. The, the best gift I got as a kid when I was just a little guy, I don't know how old I was. I was probably nine or 10. I got a basketball, a basketball goal, and a backboard. And uh, I didn't grow up like my children grew up in a neighborhood. So there wasn't a whole lot of kids within walking distance of where I grew up. There was a lot of deer, you know. There's a lot of critters down by the creek and all that because that's, that's kind of where I grew up. I, I grew up on a, an, on a little peninsula in southern Maryland about 40 miles south of the White House. And so growing up there, having a basketball was something I could do by myself. And if some guys were around and we could play, we had a great time playing. Family would come over, we'd play. So that was the, one of the greatest gifts that I had gotten. And in that, that was about the time of, of, of Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. You know, when I first started getting into basketball, they used to tape delay it. They, they, would, they would play the game the day before. They would show it a couple days later, and, and it just wasn't the same. But now, all of a sudden, people were getting excited about basketball. March Madness took on a, 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 a new uh, passion, and, and basketball really started to come into its own. And not before too long, Michael Jordan was going to come along. And, and I envisioned myself, if you can imagine this, and I, I know most of you can't relate to this, but, but maybe it was something else for you, but, but I, I could see myself being Larry Bird and hitting that last second shot at the buzzer to win the game, you know? I, I can see myself being Magic Johnson with the behind-the-back pass between the legs over the top and, and the slam dunk. And so, and so I, 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 as a young guy, started growing up, and I had great visions of, of one day maybe being able to play in the NBA because I watched it, and I got to play it, and, and, and I was pretty good. I, I have a little bit of, of, of hops, not a whole lot of hops, but a little bit of hops, if you know what I'm saying. And, uh, and so... Uh, that was my dream, my vision. Now, I used to go to a small Christian school. We had a basketball team, but the competition coaching wasn't all that good. And so I asked my parents, I said, uh, between my ninth and 10th grade year, can I, can I go to the public school? Because I wanted better competition and better coaching. And that's exactly what I got. I started going to, the, to the, uh, the local high school. And uh, instead of there being... 12 guys trying out for a 12-man squad at the Christian school. Now we've got 70, 80, maybe 100 guys trying out for a 12-man squad in the local high school. And guess what? I made it. 10th, year, 10th, 10th grade, I made the JV team, and it was so great to walk up into the coach's office and see your name on that list. Have you ever seen your name on that list? And you're thinking to yourself, your dreams and your aspirations of the NBA have just taken their first huge step forward. <laughs> JV, small county public school. And so the tryouts were great because, man, we just played basketball. We just played and we played and we played and we played and they observed. And then when you made that list of 12 and you went to the very first practice, they pulled the sheet out from under you. Because you know what they did? They had the audacity to not even bring a basketball to basketball practice, that first practice. You want to know why they didn't bring a basketball to basketball practice, that first basketball practice? Because their goal, those nice smiling coaches who were so encouraging, said, we're going to break you down. And we're going to run till every single person pukes twice. So for the first couple of weeks, you're thinking to yourself, have I joined the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, or have I joined a basketball team? Well, 40 years later, 40-some years later, I never made it to the NBA. I know it's a surprise to you. 
You see, with a body like that, how could you not make it? It was really quite easy to be Carlos with you. <laughs> Things don't always go the way you think they're going to go, right? You have a vision, you have a dream, you have an aspiration, you set your goals, but it doesn't always work out that way. Well, that's kind of where we find Moses and the nation of Israel. The parting of the Red Sea is arguably the greatest act of God in the Old Testament scriptures. And there are some truths that, that are very rich that we can mine from this passage of God's story. And one of those truths is, is that God does indeed, get this, know what he's doing. And so to set the stage, in the early chapters of Exodus, God speaks to Moses on the backside of the desert. He says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to tell him to let my people go. They've been in slavery and, and in bondage in Egypt for some 400 years. And so Moses does just that. And in order to motivate Pharaoh to let his people go, God had to intervene. And so he sent 10 terrible plagues onto Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt. And Pharaoh would shortly change his mind. He would make up his mind to let him go, and he'd quickly change it. And for 10 plagues, nine plagues leading up to that final plague, he kept changing his mind. Now, finally, the 10th plague, the death angel, it was, a, it was a, the plague to end all plagues, if you will. Pharaoh made the decision, I'm going to let him go. And so the nation of Israel packs their bags and they boldly start strutting out of Egypt into the wilderness. They're heading towards the promised land. As they start heading to the east, they get to this thing called the Red Sea. I don't know how long of a journey it was to the Red Sea. It was probably a couple of days' journey. We're, we're talking to maybe as many as three million people. This is not you packing your two kids in the back of your SUV and driving to Disney World. There's a lot that goes into that, right? But imagine two, three million people, men, women, children, animals, stuff, everything you've got. And they're going through the desert and they come to the Red Sea and then they head south and they go down and God is leading them with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud during the day. And then all of a sudden God leads them down to the south and then he says, oh, 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 turn around. I want you to come back. And Pharaoh has some spies, I assume, because he noticed what's going on and he thinks to himself, they've gotten to a position where they are confused they don't know what they're doing. And he changes his mind. So he gathers his army together with his chariots and they set out. They are going to go and capture the people. What in the world have I done? I need them back. We pick up the story, Exodus 14 and verse 11. You're going to have to listen faster this morning, guys. Here we go. You ready? Verse 14, verse 11, chapter 14. They said to Moses, get this. It's only been a couple of days, 400 years of bondage. Everyone there, all they have ever known is slavery. They have not known a breath of freedom until this po point in time. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What in the world? They're starting to complain already. It's only literally been hours. Get the picture, guys. 400 years hard labor. Hours of freedom. And now, because their back is against the Red Sea, and they can see the pillar of dust rising behind them, and the pillar of dust is Pharaoh and a thousand or more chariots with his armies racing towards them. You getting the picture? Moses, what have you done? Is it because there's no graves in Egypt you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? 
Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. There's no record of them saying that. They may have said that, but the truth of the matter was is they wanted out. Now they got what they want. And they're complaining. They're grumbling. They're griping to Moses and to God. And Moses said to the people, fear not. Red Sea, smoke of the enemy coming. Fear not. Stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never, ever see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent or to be still. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord." when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. And at this point, God does three miracles for the Israelites. Miracle number one is this. God moved the pillar of cloud that he was leading them with in front of them. He moved it to behind them to create a visible barrier between Pharaoh and the Egyptian armies and the Israelites. Verse 19. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the hosts of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night long. Miracle number two, God parted the Red Sea. There was no way out. The geography of the land was there was these huge, massive uh, objects to the north. There was a wilderness wandering to the south, and if they had gotten out into the wilderness, they would have been hunted like, like deer. They would have been picked off by Pharaoh and his chariots and his armies. But then God performed a third miracle this day. God drowned the Egyptians who were in hot pursuit of Israel. Verse 23. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. All, that's an important little word. All Pharaoh's horses, all of his chariots, all of his horsemen. And you know what all means, right? Theologically, all means all. Just, you know, trying to help you here. Sometimes we make things more complicated than we are, than they are. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. When it was all said and done, God had utterly wiped out the most powerful armed forces on the face of the planet of that day. All that was left 
were Egyptian army soldiers and horses strewn on the shoreline of the Red Sea. That sounds like a spectacular story. And maybe you say to yourself this morning, Hutch, come on. Do you really believe that that took place that day? Just like you read there in Exodus chapter 14? And to you, I would say, yes, I do. I believe it happened exactly like that. Moses was an eyewitness, by the way, and he's the one that wrote this down. Now, there are a lot of skeptics today who want to postulate a, a human rationale or an explanation of, of how this really couldn't have, have happened this way. It had to be responsible. The moon was responsible or the, the sun was responsible or, or something like that. But there is no human explanation for it, no rational way to explain it away. For all of us who know God in a real and personal way, we are hidden behind the blood covering of the Lord Jesus that he made available for us on the cross of Calvary. We talked about that last time in our study, if you'll remember correctly. For all of us who hide behind that blood covering, it's really no surprise that God would would work in such a supernatural way because we've seen him work in our lives in a supernatural way. Felix gave his testimony last week of how God worked in a supernatural way to not only bring him to faith in Christ, but to work in him and through him since he came to faith in Christ. That's a miracle. You and I experience miracles all the time, whether we realize it or not. So the Bible's account of what happened here at the Red Sea is really no problem for us to believe. And that's exactly what I believe. Now, maybe you're thinking, Hutch, come on now. That's a great story from the Bible. But really, 3,500 years ago? It's 2022. What in the world does that have to do with me? Why would you take my time on a Friday morning, an hour of my life, I'm never going to get back, by the way, to tell me a story like this? I don't see the relevance. Well, you know, that's a great question, but for our remainder of our time together, I want to frame our study with a different question. And that question is this. How do you think the Israelites felt when their back was against the Red Sea? And Pharaoh and his army was barreling towards them. And they were not only in the proverbial between the rock and the hard place, but they were against a watery grave and assassins wanting to kill them. You know how I think they felt? I think they felt trapped. I think they felt helpless. I think they felt hopeless. I think they felt God had failed them. I think they felt that God had forsaken them. I think they felt that God had forgotten about them. God, you just play games with us. You bring us out here. You put us in this position. For what? The truth is that as followers of Jesus Christ... As we follow God's leading in our life, we oftentimes find ourselves with our backs against our own Red Seas. Where do we go? What do we do? I, I'm in trouble. I'm at a dead end. Maybe it's a, a financial Red Sea, or, or maybe it's a medical Red Sea, or a job-related Red Sea, or a marriage-related Red Sea, or a parenting-related Red Sea. But you, you, you feel like, just like the Israelites did, God, where are you? What have you done? Have you forgotten? Have you forsaken? God, what are you doing? I'm here in this problem. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand. And there was three lessons that God wanted to teach the Israelites, that he wants to teach you and he wants to teach me. And that's the same reason why he allows us to get into some Red Sea moments in our life. Reason number one, to provide for their future blessings. 
The first reason that God not only allowed, but caused them to be in this situation was to provide for their future blessings. You want to know why? Because here's the simple truth. God knew that someday down the road, Pharaoh was going to change his mind and he was going to go out and he was going to try to bring the Israelites back. He also knew that with his, his military superiority, his modern transportation, these thousand chariots he sent out, they were going to be sitting ducks in the wilderness. Pew, pew, pew. Picked off one by one. But by luring the Egyptians into the Red Sea Basin, he took the problem out in just one night. You remember, he, he was fulfilling a promise he made to Abraham. Your seed is going to be so numerous, you won't be able to number them. And oh, by the way, I've got a land for you land of promise. Number two, the second reason was this, was to teach the Israelites that they could trust him no matter what. 400 years, God had been at work. They didn't see it. They didn't hear it. They didn't hear great messages taught in a gymnasium on a Friday morning. They just worked day in and, and day out. But I want you to notice a little detail. You know, God's in the details, right? You know that, right? Yes, this means yes, this means no. This means I'm sleeping or meditating or trying to fool you or praying that you would finish quickly. See, I'm so hungry this morning. Hey, look at verse 27, Exodus chapter 14. Listen to this. When the morning had appeared. Powerful, isn't it? Why didn't God take care of closing the Red Sea at any moment in time, all night long. Israel has now gone through the Red Sea. Egypt is coming into the Red Sea. He could have caused those waters to flow like normal at any moment in time. But you wanted to know something? God said, listen, I have brought you this far, not just to, to take care of your problem. I'm going to take care of your problem. But I brought you this far because I want you to see me take care of your problem. <laughs> there are no accidents with God. There was purpose behind everything he did. Notice this, Exodus chapter 13. Go back just one chapter in verse 18. Look at this with me. Again, this is so amazing. I don't know how you can sit there. You got to stand up and jump. Look at this. Look at what it says. But God led the people, circle, highlight, underline, but God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Now go down to verse 21, three verses later. And the Lord went before them. Did you hear that? God led the way, God went before them. God led the way, God went before them. God led the way, God went before them. He was there the entire time. God wanted the Israelites to see him intervene on their behalf so that they would learn, you can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me in any circumstance, in any situation, whether your back is against the wall or whether you're swimming in the pool, whether you're on vacation or at work, whether you're at church, whether you're at home, wherever you are, I can take care of you. It's been said, we don't realize that God is all we need until all we have is God. Verse 29, let's go keep on going. Man, it just gets better and better and better. It's kind of like eating breakfast. It's getting better and better and better. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the Red Sea. Ooh, hot, man, right there. You know, I told you about where I grew up. 
I grew up on a peninsula between the Chesapeake Bay and the Patuxent River. My mom and dad owned some land on the, on the river. And so we used to go over there and spend a lot of weekends there. And family was there and visit. And you know what? As the tide would come in, it would come up. And we would watch that. It was an amazing thing. And then the tide would go out. And you know, every time the tide went out, there was an awful smell. Have you ever smelled swamp? Mm, man, just stays with you. Swampland stays swampy for a long, long time. But God made it so that that little swampy bottom, it wasn't so swampy, John, anymore. It says they walked across dusty dirt. Takes care of the details. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the Red Sea, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and to the left. Can you imagine walking through and seeing all sorts of marine life just looking at you? I don't know what kind of marine life was there, but you're thinking to yourself, I should have brought a pole and a hook because I can see is right there. But you know, when you go out fishing with a stick as a kid, and you throw down that stick, and it lands right here, and the next thing you know, the fish is over there. There's something about the refraction of the water. But listen, I can reach in there almost and grab myself a bass or whatever it is they had there because it's a wall. It's the, the Atlanta Aquarium is great. But man, they're all there as I'm walking through. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power of the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared, hit this, so the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And you haven't listened fast enough. Goodness gracious, guys, come on. My word. Did I tell you the third reason yet? I didn't even tell you the third reason yet. My goodness, third reason? Yeah, for, what was the first reason? Mark, what was the first reason? To provide for future blessings. What was the second lesson? What was the second? To teach Israel that they could count on him no matter what. Third blessing, you don't know why he did this? To bring glory to himself. And we just saw that. And this is not in your notes, so you may want to write this verse down. Go back and look at it later. Exodus 14 and verse 4. God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, the Israelites, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians, the Egyptians, the enemy, the forces of evil will know that I am the Lord. And God led the Israelites into an impossible situation so that it would only be obvious that he was the one who would come in and intervene. And God leads. And God goes before us. And it shouldn't be a surprise that he takes us beside the Red Sea moments in our life because he wants us to learn those same three lessons. Exodus 18.1. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, the priest of Midian, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought them out of Egypt. There was no Fox News, CNN, headline news. There were no cell towers and cell phones. There was only a few carrier pigeons, but they spent 400 years in slavery. They weren't even educated enough to write. But Jethro, hundreds of miles away, heard of God's deliverance. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, there's another one here. Look at this next one, Jeremiah chapter 2. Oh, man, Rahab, you remember her? How would you like to go down into history as Rahab the harlot? I mean, the worst day of your life. 
That's how you remembered. How are you going to approach Rahab when you get to heaven? And she introduces herself. Oh, I know who you are. You are Rahab the... Yeah, yeah, that's me. All right? Well, look at this. Verse 9. This is Rahab. She's talking to two spies. Remember, 12 spies went out, and so the spies are here. And, and notice what it says here. I know that the Lord has given you the land. It's already a done deal. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us, all of my people, and that all of the inhabitants of the land melt before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And as soon as we we heard it, our hearts melted. Then there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is the God of heavens above and the earth beneath. And get this, 3,500 years later, every time somebody watches the movie, The Ten Commandments, God still gets the glory. Man, I got so much more to say, but I don't have time to say it. So we're going to break the tables. I'll come back and wrap it up in a few minutes. God bless you. All right, guys, let's zero in and land the plane. Man, I had so much more to tell you, just didn't get to it. But maybe some other time we'll come back and look at this text. You know, I don't know where you are today. I mean, I know where you are. You're here, obviously. But uh, I don't know where you are in your journey of faith. Because you may be here today or you may be watching us online and, and your back is against the Red Sea right now. And you may be there, number one, because God's got something better for you in the future. And he's preparing the situation, the scenario, or he's preparing you. Maybe, uh, maybe he wants to eliminate some enemy that you would face. Uh, maybe... Um, Maybe there's a blessing out there that hasn't fully come together yet that he's going to take a little bit more time to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Maybe, maybe he's doing some surgery in your life, some self-destructive habit that is keeping you from experiencing God's best and he's just carving it away. Or maybe you're at your Red Sea moment today because God wants to teach you at an even deeper level to understand that you can trust him. No matter what you're facing. My goodness, when we look at the news, and we see the craziness that's going on in our world. And then we flip over in our Bibles to Ezekiel and Daniel, and Revelation. Oh, that's right. It's going to be a mess before he splits the eastern sky and makes all things right. It's going to wax worse and worse. Or maybe, maybe the Red Sea in your life is just so that God could intervene and get glory for himself. So that your neighbors, your coworkers, your far from God family members, man, what he said, he lived. It's real. So our challenge today is to realize this. Number one, God knows what he's doing. Number two, the challenge for us to, to realize is that we can trust God 
no matter what we are going through, what we're facing, or what's facing us. And number three, we must decide. We're not going to doubt God, period. We're not going to mumble. We're not going to grumble. We're not going to gripe. We're not going to complain. I didn't have time to go into it. But it says that when Israel walked out of Egypt, they walked out with a little bit of pep in their step. They walked out with boldness. They may have been strutting, you know. Got this. See you later, alligator. But just hours later, Moses, what are you doing? Did you bring us out here to kill us? You know, it's the amazing thing. We're studying life of Moses because there's so much in there. We're not going to be able to study all of this. But there was moments where God, where God wanted to destroy the Israelites. And Moses said, whoa, God, whoa, God, oh, please, please, please. And then there was other moments when, when Moses prayed to God, God, destroy these stinking people. <laughs> but aren't you glad Moses and God didn't have a bad day on the same day? <laughs> Father, thank you. Oh, man, thank you. Thank you that you are a miracle-working God. And that every Red Sea moment that we face in life you have a purpose and a plan. We may not understand it. We may not like it. We not, may not even be able to see how you are at work. But when we look at Israel's story, we understand you've always got a plan. You can always be trusted. And if we ever find ourselves in a moment of doubt, remind us of the truth of your word. I thank you for the Red Sea moments in my life. I haven't enjoyed, I don't think any of them, to be quite honest with you. But every one of them has been used by you to mold me and shape me into who I am today. And truth be known, there are other Red Sea moments for each and every one of us. And I pray that you would bring us back to the truth of Exodus chapter 14 and the message you have delivered to us today. And in the end, Lord, we thank you that you do have a better plan for us. Lord, you do work all things together for good to those who love you and those who are called according to your purpose, and that's us if we know you as our personal Savior. So, Father, we thank you today. We praise you today. And we don't doubt you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, God bless you. We're going to come back. We're going to look at Moses again next week, so I hope you'll be here. Bring somebody with you.